Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Perriello, and I'm really excited to be here tonight with Leslie Coburn. Uh, I am the former congressman from this district, the Virginia 5th, and it is soon going to be back in Democratic hands, thanks to this amazing uh, nominee. And I know a lot of you have been so impressed by what she's done over the years to make the world a better place and the bold ideas she's put out there. And this is a chance to get to know her a little bit. And so we were just going to have a conversation tonight. And to me, I'm a big believer in origin stories, whether it's campaigns or or, you know, superhero movies. So I'm curious what got you into this. I mean, you have this incredible career as an investigative journalist. You've covered six wars. You've uncovered huge scandals out there to protect consumers and protect our soldiers. What on earth made you walk down that path? Well, I think when I was in college, uh, and we went to the same college, oh, as a matter of fact, um, after my first year, I decided that I wanted to moved to Africa. I was very interested in anthropology. I thought I might want to be an anthropologist. So I moved to a village way out in the middle of nowhere in Kenya in, in a place called Yukambani. So I was living in a place where the, most people had this never- wasn't Peace Corps or anything else. You were just like, I'm gonna up and do this. It was, what it was, it was through the flying doctors. Oh, okay. And the flying doctors who were amazing, they had a ground team working in Kenya. So the ground team thought, well, what can we do with this young woman? And they put me up in a village and they said, we'll see what happens, see how much you can learn. They had terrible uh, problems with children with uh, malnutrition and they couldn't figure out why in this particular village. So I did go and um, they did adopt me. In fact, they wanted me to stay and marry there and I got lots of, lots of offers. But I did find out what the problems were and it was very interesting because I asked a lot of questions. You know, why won't you, when they want your children to put eggs in the porridge to give more protein, why won't you do it? And they said, well, but the kids will grow up to be chicken thieves. Why would we do that? So it was like an initiation into journalism in a very kind of extreme setting. And I really fell in love with working in the third world and in being with people who were very different from, from me. And that led me to later after I finished college, I then went to graduate school and then I went, uh, my first job was at NBC News in London and then I worked for 60 Minutes and then came back to New York um, for um, CBS Reports and then 60 Minutes again and ABC News and all of those programs, but always covering stories overseas, usually quite complicated, uh, sometimes very dangerous stories, but always about U.S. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And what, was that a path that was pretty wide open to you, or did you have a lot of structural barriers as you went along? There were a lot of barriers. There weren't a lot of women doing that work. And uh, in fact, the first war I was allowed to cover was Central America. Mm. I covered the Contra War and really exposed uh, I got in big trouble in that war because the, uh, it was a war that was, um, you know, actually the U.S. involvement was much more than was being admitted. Um, so there was a lot of illegality in that war and the Contras uh, were doing some really terrible things. So I exposed all of that. I got mm. some of the top people in the Contra movement to turn and talk about what was really going on. How the heck did you do that? Um, persuasion. Yeah. Persuasion. Yeah. Do you think any of that is uh, going to be relevant uh, to being able to serve in Congress? I think it is relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to talk to people who are very different from, from you and uh, bringing them over to your point of view or finding common ground. I do think it's relevant. I know from some of the work I've done overseas, sometimes people think it's really dangerous when it's not dangerous at all, and then there are other times where it's pretty darn dangerous. Uh, that sounds like some stuff that probably had some serious physical risk involved, or were you in a oh, yeah. sort of, because you had the camera, did that make you more protected or less protected? No, it was, uh, you're definitely not more protected in, in that kind of situation with a camera. And for example, I spent time in Somalia before the U.S. forces went into Somalia. That was really the most dangerous time you could possibly be in that country. Um, what does it mean to you as someone who spent your life as a journalist uncovering facts to see uh, the way the media is being treated today? Well, one of the reasons why I decided to run for Congress was because Trump started talking about the media as the enemy of the people. 
and I thought he absolutely crossed a line. It's really important to me that the media, uh, I mean, we have no democracy if we don't have a free press. We have to have it. Since the very foundation of this country, I am a big fan of Tom Paine. And uh, so I understand and I've covered a lot of countries where they don't have a free press. Um, so when he did that, I thought we are heading down a very, very dangerous path. And it was really an important reason for, for running. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've been really frustrated. Obviously, I've been appalled by what he's done in terms of even sort of inciting violence against the press, but also the failure of Republicans who have stood for uh, democracy and human rights overseas not standing up and pushing back. I mean, John McCain was such a great champion on those issues. I'd actually worked recently with his wife, Cindy McCain, on an op-ed on, on Congo. And so... You know, I think part of what it takes in these situations is not just that you don't do certain things, but who steps up in the wake of that. And so I think it's so important that you stepped up to run. Um, but it's also been disappointing not to see, you know, Republicans, including your uh, opponent in this race, be willing to come out and actually talk about these fundamental American principles like protection of the fourth estate. Yeah, that's right. It's very disappointing. And so what do you see, think has changed the most for better and for worse um, in journalism and media over, over your lifetime? I mean, we don't have three evening news programs anymore. That, no, it's you know. so different. I think that what's really changed is that people are no longer, it's, it's very expensive to do really good journalism, particularly good investigations. Those investigations can take up to a year <laughs> to do, and it's expensive. And I think media organizations are not willing to spend that money anymore. And all we used to have bureaus all over the world. Right. And now there are hardly any bureaus, yeah. which means you rely on people locally. You don't have your own people around the world. And um, so it's just resources. Yeah. I've even seen that in my lifetime. You know, it used to be there was the person who knew Sierra Leone really well. And now it's the, you know, someone flies in by helicopter the day before the election to cover the election. And the quality of knowledge you get is very different seen it here in the fifth district where there used to be sort of reporters with 20 30 years of political experience that knew the ins and outs and most of the papers just don't have the budget for that or haven't chosen to invest in that um which is tough i mean i think the quality yeah. of journalism really drives it what are the stories that you feel had the most uh impact directly on people's lives or the ones you're most proud of over the years there are a number of them one that i talk about on the campaign trail which i am proud of is the um, there was a time in the war in Iraq when the National Guard was being asked to go on patrol around Baghdad in Humvees with no armor on the bottom. Um, they called them cardboard coffins. And they would go out, there was a dump yard outside of Baghdad where they would pick up pieces of scrap metal to tack onto them to try and save their legs. And then they also tried putting sandbags on the bottom. And this didn't work. And of course, those units were very cohesive, all those guard units. So you could have people who were neighbors, people who were related, uh, killed in one of these um, Humvees. So I got together with the guard, and we did a big expose on 60 Minutes. And it really made a huge difference. And I told that story in Franklin County when, on the campaign trail. And a woman jumped up and said, I'm a former Army colonel, and I was in Rumsfeld's office when that story went on the air, and it really made a huge difference. And I've heard to the general who was in charge of, um, of up armoring these uh, Humvees, he too said how important it was. So it seems like that's a perfect way for people to understand what's possible for a po what a politician could do in the fifth district. That's incredible. I mean, to, to see that causal link, first of all, you know, you have to have the guts to be there in the way that you were. You have to be willing to uncover a story that certain people in the Pentagon probably didn't really want uncovered. Um, and then to know that directly related into policy change. I know Jim Webb pushed really hard, our senator at the time, to do it in the wake of your reporting. And there are probably a lot of people, a lot of men and women in uniform who are alive today or are in one piece today because of that work. Do you ever get to meet any of the uh, folks afterwards who were affected by that? Yes, I, I did. And I, I think that um, uh, it's, it's hugely satisfying when that happens. But other kinds of stories, um, for example, there one car manufacturer uh, had built a car 
with the gas tank in the wrong place. And they didn't fix it because they did a cost benefit analysis and decided. You did that story? Yeah. And they decided that, that, that not that many people, uh, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's the most callous thing you can do because what's the life of one child burned up in the backseat of their parents' station wagon? So that I worked on that story for many, many months to get it just right and put it on the air. And, but for e doing each of those stories, you have to fight really hard to get it on the air because you're going up against, you're speaking truth to power. You are going up mm. against really powerful organizations. Another one was- um, I wanna just brag on you for a second. So for those who don't know, this was a company that knew this particular design was gonna lead to more deaths and they figured out how much they would have to pay in the lawsuits for the dead people and figured out that was cheaper than actually changing the design or doing the callback. And so they simply said, we will take on that. And then this reporting was exposed and saved all these lives because then they had to redesign the car to be uh, safer in that way where the gas tank was. That's incredible yeah. reporting. But another one, there was also a period when the price of, of uh, gas was so high that people were deciding they didn't have enough money to go to the movies, mm -hmm. and which I thought was outrageous. And we were told at that time that it was because of demand in China. So the price of oil was going up. That didn't sound right to me. And I checked it out. And in fact, the demand in China was going down. So it turned out that it was Wall Street banks that had bought up commodities and were engaged in really what became oil speculation. In other words, they were buying up refineries. They were buying up pipelines. They were buying up oil and storing it offshore in ships. And when you do that, the price is distorted. And it, so it was, it was the market rather than anything to do with China. But when, it's when you find something like that and it really putting that report on the air, which got a big, that got a George Polk, it got a big award. And when you find something like that and you're able to, to shift things so that people realize that that's not the truth and this is the truth. Um, it's it's exactly what I want to apply in this new political life. It's such a great skill set for Congress. I mean, I wasn't there very long, but one, you just got to have the instinct to care about the vulnerable, to care about the people that are getting screwed by the system. And then two, you've got to have the, the courage to go after those that are causing the problem. And then you've got to have the skill set to know how to investigate it and get to the facts. And you don't know where that leads at the beginning of a story. I mean, how many times have you started a story not knowing what yeah. the answer is going to be? But when you look at it now, whether it's our, you know, healthcare system or uh, cost of college education or other things, like there are a lot of questions that need to be asked right Absolutely. now. Um, Absolutely. We've got a real platform there in Congress to, to do that. What are the issues you're most excited to tackle when you get up there? Well, you just mentioned student loans. That's a really important one for me because I think that we are, um, we have a, a whole generation who we're putting into debt slavery right now. We need to change the interest rates. We need to change the whole system. You need to be able to get out of a student loan with bankruptcy. Um, and I want to really work hard on that. Because right now in Virginia, you know, the average amount of student loan for someone, say, going to Averitt in Danville, $35,000. A lot of money. Yeah. Um, so, and healthcare, uh, I, I can't tell you, though you, since you're the other person who's really spent a lot of time going through every county and really getting to know people, so you would understand this, but um, people are desperate for good healthcare and they're really, really worried that they're going to lose it because right now the Trump administration has said they want to say it's unconstitutional to give healthcare, good, reasonably priced, guaranteed healthcare to people with pre-existing conditions. Mm. So I ask people to raise their hand if they don't have a pre-existing condition and there, no one raises their hand. Yeah. So just being able to be in a position to, um, to change things and to change, for example, the price of drugs. Everyone in this district, they're splitting their pills in half, particularly older people. 
they can't afford the drugs, the diabetes medicine, the, the migraine medicine, the cancer medicine. They can't afford them. And I really want to hold those hearings. I really, on the House Oversight Committee, I really want to hold those hearings and say, how is it that we spend so much more than anybody else in the world for our drugs? What, um, when, you know, I know that you obviously have a lot of Democrats excited about you. There are a lot of independents that are so appalled by uh, what they've seen uh, from the White House and, and from, um, from the Republican Party in the Trump era, but also a lot of Republicans have been coming your way. What's, what is it that is bringing people to, to this campaign and to, and to you? There are a couple of reasons for the Republicans. One, they're fed up with Trump. There is quite a large group of Republicans in the district who are. I think you see real splits, particularly in the rural counties, between Tea Party people and more moderate Republicans. And the splits have been very bitter because there have been disputes playing out locally in the boards of supervisors and whatnot. But the more moderate Republicans, particularly because we're in a big rural area, what do they care about? They care about land conservation. They care about environmental issues. They care about land issues. I care about those issues too. So they come over because of that. Um, well, I know you've been you've been fighting on conservation for a long time, and also on on the the pipelines that are a big issue in some of those areas. Does that come up much? It comes up all the time, and yes, I have been fighting on conservation issues. For example, I was on the board of the Piedmont Environmental Council for a decade, and during Which that has maintained a tremendous bipartisan consensus over the years. Yes, I mean, that's been the leadership of you and of Chris and others. But it's incredible how you have kept that really transpartisan and in many ways. That's true. But issues like uranium mining, which now is a hot issue again, because we have it before the Supreme Court. It may, we may lose the ban on uranium mining. And Southside and Southwest, people are very concerned about that. In, uh, and that's bipartisan. So I, I would fight very hard to, uh, to make sure that we do not have terrible, terrible toxic waste dumps around our district from uranium mining. Yeah. Look at, we have, we have all this information. We know what happened in the Southwest. We know what happened to the Navajo. There's a, there's a uranium mountain of tailings in Moab, Utah, one of the driest places on earth. They are removing that now because for years it's been seeping into the Colorado River and going all the way down to the drinking water in Los Angeles. And finally, Los Angeles complained and said, you have to clean this up. But this is a very long way away, and that will happen in Virginia. So do you regret running yet? I mean, it's kind of a miserable process. Uh, I, for one, am not like, I don't enjoy, I enjoy the, the, you know, the interactions with people, but there are a lot of other things. Is there anything about um, entering the fray of politics that's surprised you in a positive way and anything that's uh, disappointed you along the way? I think I understood intellectually that uh, it was a pretty vicious game, but uh, experiencing it is something else. It's a good thing that I've had the opportunity as a journalist of coming up against very powerful Republicans in the past. I mean, the Reagan administration um, locked me out of every government agency after I did that big expose on the dirty war uh, about the Contras. Mm. So I've had the experience of going up against that kind of power. Uh, I'm experiencing it now because we're doing so well. I mean, we're, we're neck and neck. We're 50-50, which is amazing in the fifth. <laughs> and so they're getting angry and worried. Um, so they'll be lobbing grenades like crazy. And we just have to hold our course because we've been out here over a year working in every county. And we've got great local leadership. And I think that'll carry us through. Yeah. Well, and for those tuning in, um, you know, when I ran in a decade ago in 2008, it was seen as not, we were seen as not having a chance. We were 30 points behind. And at this point, you know, we were still well into double digit digits behind. I mean, you are in a much better position to win this even than I was when we pulled it off 10 years ago. And I think that's been grassroots energy. It's a compelling candidate. Um, it's the nature of the politics of where we are right now and, uh, you know, that wave. But, you know, 
you are in a great position to flip this seat. What is it that's most important for people to do who do want to help out and make sure that we put the fight in fifth back in blue hands? Well, because it could, because we're neck and neck, it could be so close. It could be one vote could win this. So that means that we know that all too well in Virginia after we the know that delegate it, races last year. Exactly. It's already happened. So I think that um, everybody needs to get involved. And in the, in the district, everybody who has an extra second in the day has to get in touch with the campaign and we can put them to work. And, you know, it, these days it's not just phone banks and going door to door, although that's my favorite is going door to door. I really love that. But it's also texting parties. It's uh, all these other things that um, it's writing postcards. Yeah. This is a very grassroots campaign. We're even doing, uh, we've even rented three billboards. Yeah, three billboards. Well, there was a movie about three billboards, but that's something <laughs> totally different. Um, yeah, I think the Indivisible chapter here has already done over 3,500 postcards. Um, they do that once or twice a week. So there's like, there's something for everyone. If you're not a door person, you can do phones. If you're not a phone person, you can do texting and postcards. But this really is, you know, um, going to be a, a grassroots outreach effort. Yeah. Um, and what do you what do you think is the single mo if people do have a chance, they run into a old friend at the grocery store from high school um, and, you know, they want to say one thing about you, about why they should get out and vote and vote for you. What's the most important thing for people to know about Leslie Coburn? Because this campaign is going to flip the fifth and then we're going to flip the House of Representatives. And that will be a very dramatic change, of course, for this country. But the one thing we really want to do is we want to make America fair again. Hmm. That's the key. And we will do that. And we're going to, I've already found out that it's going to, that it is possible to get permission to take the door off the office so that everyone can come in. It'll be an embassy for the people of the fifth rather than being closed off completely as it is now. Yeah. We're not being represented. So it'll be such a change to have a campaign that's really listening and really figuring out how to push forward legislation that helps people in the fifth. Well, who better do that than someone who spent a career listening to people, asking questions, uh, and then fighting for, uh, for, for fair policies, whether that's protecting our soldiers in Iraq or consumers or others. It's really just been uh, incredible. So thank you for taking some time uh, tonight to get to know uh, to let me get to know you better and, and some folks out there to know as well. And I just want to wish you luck. You got a big debate tomorrow night. Is that right? Debate tomorrow night in Rapid.